Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report now presents a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of our nation's outstanding leaders. Now here's Minnesota businessman Arnold Paulson. This is a great pleasure for me today to have this opportunity to moderate this panel. Today we're going to discuss some of the most vital and complex problems confronting our American economy. Uh, these problems deal with American agriculture, uh, the uh, tight money situation, uh, the effect that agriculture has on our national economy and so forth. And to start out, I'd like to make a few brief remarks. Today, the American people seem quite concerned about the money situation in the United States, and we hear many people complaining about tight money. Just what do we mean by tight money? The American people have been able to purchase almost anything they desire with no down payment and almost forever to pay. If money was any looser, they'd have to pay the people to charge. And yet, last week we noticed on the front cover of one of the nation's leading magazines that the federal government this year will be spending approximately $178 billion. I wonder if the American people realize how much $178 billion actually amounts to. As we divide this by the 55 million American people in the United States, it means that the government this year will be spending over $3,000 per family to run our federal government. Now these are some of the problems we're going to discuss today, and yet the experts in government seem to tell us that we shouldn't be concerned about the debt. We shouldn't be concerned about the interest that we're paying on the federal debt and so forth. Well, I'd like to draw a very simple illustration for the audience today. Let's just imagine that back at the, in the days of Christ, that we deposited one penny in a bank at 6% compounded interest. Do you know how much it would amount to today? You'd have a ball of gold larger than the earth. And yet the politicians and the experts in Washington say that we shouldn't be concerned about this fantastic debt-fueled economy that we're living in. If we, the American people, don't wake up now, immediately, we're heading for disaster. <coughs> if we don't solve this, as I might call it, uh, insane economic system that we're living under today, our national economy is going through the ringer. And today I have some distinguished panelists with me who have appeared at a uh, seminar uh, here in Sioux City, Iowa this past week. And I, it's a great pleasure for me to have them with me and to introduce them and to discuss this problem with us. But before doing so, I'd like to read a recent article that appeared in the Kansas City paper on February 6th. A Kansas City bank-based holding company, CK, CBK Industries Incorporated, announced plans last week to phase out of its manufacturing and distributing operations and to shift <coughs> into farming, primarily the production of feed grains. Principal holdings of the company now are businesses engaged in the manufacture and the distribution of women's apparels and foreign films, asphalt, and printing. A five-year five program was announced by the president. He says it provides for the gradual acquisition of lease and purchase of a minimum of 80,000 acres of farmland, primarily in the Corn Belt area. Now listen to this. They say that the management believes there is a new era emerging in agriculture and that a corporate entry into this field is most timely, said the president. Well, now we have with us today Mr. Homer Jackson, uh, manager of the Production Credit Association from Rifle, uh, Colorado. And at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to you people. And I'd like to ask Mr. Jackson to comment on the statement that I just read. Mr. Jackson, welcome to the program. Thank you, Arnold. Well, what you've just uh, read, Arnold, uh, we see taking place out in Colorado, not in farming, but in the feedlot uh, operations. Uh, Fifteen years ago, 90 
percent or 95 percent of all the cattle fed and the lambs fed in the state of Colorado were fed by uh, farm family feedlot operations. And today, seven feedlots feed 70 percent of the livestock that's fed in the state of Colorado. The large corporate commercial feedlots are crowding out the family-owned feedlot operation. Well, what's this area. going to mean <coughs> to uh, thousands of rural communities as the corporate structure moves in? The uh, end of it is in sight, it seems to me. Now, our farm people there that were in the feedlot business in the beginning thought that, well, if we're crowded out of the feeding business, we can still sell feed to these feedlots. But now they find that the feedlots uh, control all of the feed and they're setting the price on this feed to the place where they're crowding them out of producing feed. And it, it simply means that our farm families are going out of the picture. Now young folks can't get into the farming and they can't get into the livestock business today on the basis of owning their farms or ranches. We're not, uh, we're not getting the cost of production out of the livestock that we produce there in the state of Colorado. We ran a study on that in our production credit association. We find that, uh, and of course these are average figures, Arnold, but we took typical ranch operations and we took operations with a continuous record with us for a period of eight years now. And to briefly state it, it's costing us $115 a head to run a breeding cow there in western Colorado. Mm. And we get an 86% calf crop from that cow. Uh, we have a 5% death loss. And our calves, the steer and heifer calf weights, average 382 pounds. Well, to figure that out, uh, it, which I have here, it costs us $142 a head to produce a to calf. To produce a calf. And uh, our calves weighing 382 pounds, the average steer and heifer calf price this year has amounted to $27.50, which means a $105 price for the calves we've sold. So actually, we're selling our calves today for $37 a head less than the cost of production. And the thing that people don't uh, realize is that we've been doing that uh, to varying degrees for the past eight years. Our ranch people are building up their loans continuously. The size of our loans have doubled in the past five years. We've had to use real estate to, to make up for this lack of farm income. And our uh, real estate now, you mentioned tight money in your opening statement. The high interest rates and the tight money have made it now almost impossible to sell land. Uh, prospective buyers can't find financing and they, they can't afford these high long-term interest rates. It's getting almost <coughs> impossible for the young generation to get into <coughs> agriculture, isn't it? It is impossible, Arnold, and uh, I think uh, people are aware, surely, that we're losing farm people today at the highest rate ever in the history of this nation. There's more than 100,000 farm families going out of business each year in, in this nation. It certainly isn't because the uh, farm, young farm boys don't like agriculture, but there's just no future in it for them and they have no choice. <coughs> To me, it seems like the farmers are working for everybody else, but uh, with the exception of themselves today. Well, the farm people uh, must, uh, must get after this because no one's going to give us anything. Either we have to protect what we have or we're going to lose it, and we're losing it just as fast as we can. The most disheartening thing to me I operate the Production Credit Association. I have operated it there for the past 24 years. We uh, encourage these boys and girls in 4-H club work and future farmer organizations, uh, bring them up to the point to where when they graduate from school, 
they want to get married and settle down, they find out that they've been uh, led on in a business that's impossible for them to continue in. They just simply can't own their operating uh, well, units today. Well, in your estimation, what, what do you uh, actually think is causing this uh, uh, low farm price and low farm income? Well, Arnold, uh, I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, there's been investigations made. The National Food Marketing Commission here last uh, 18 months made a very thorough investigation of our nation's marketing methods in agriculture. We have the greatest demand for meat, especially, that we've ever had, and particularly for beef. Our per capita consumption of beef has more than doubled in the past uh, quarter of a century. People are paying the highest retail prices in history for it. Our rate of uh, consumption today is so rapid that we're consuming meat today within four days after slaughter. Mm. In other words, if slaughter were to cease today, uh, America would have less than a four-day supply of meat on hand. Now, in the, in the face of this increasing demand, uh, during 1966, there's not one of us in our lifetime ever knew of the demand for meat being any greater than it's been this past year. And still, the price of fat cattle is $3 below what it was this time a year ago. The price of hogs is $8 below, $8 a hundred I'm talking about. And the price of lambs from 6 to $7 a hundred less than it was. Now that simply means this, that the retail end of the food industry has the monopolistic control over the market. In other words, they're setting the prices. They're setting a price that we in agriculture just can't continue under. We can't produce at that price. Well, I've noticed this, that <clears throat> as you listen to the market reports in the early morning, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, you're already getting the market, and the market doesn't open till 9 o'clock. This proves that the prices have already been set. Oh, before there. the market opens. So what chance does a farmer have under this? But uh, uh, Mr. Jackson, I'd like to ask Mr. Wilkin just one question. Uh, getting back to the grains, uh, uh, you've done some research on the uh, uh, production of grains, uh, food grains and feed grains in this country. Uh, have we been overproducing? Have we created surpluses according to your survey? Well, according to the President's uh, economic report, published in January, uh, the record proves that from uh, 1942 to 1965, we produced uh, less farm products, that is, the increase was less per year than it was from uh, 29 to 42. All right, well, and, now... Uh, <coughs> the facts are that we haven't had any surplus farm production since 1910. Of course, now the farmers have been told that the reason they can't get a price is because they've overproduced. And then, of course, when we talk about uh, uh, increased production, they say that the farmers are more efficient, they're producing more than they did, and this is why they shouldn't have a price. How does farm production compare with consumption and the increase in population? Well, the farm production from 42 to 66 has not kept up with the increase in population. In other words, we're going backwards. That's correct. In, uh, in your estimation, uh, uh, is the food situation in the United States at this time critical? Well, it's very critical <coughs> at the uh, present moment because uh, we're completely uh, uh, bare of reserves. And if we should have a drought like we had in 34, we would have chaos. We would have to liquidate about half of our livestock population because we wouldn't have the feed to take care of them, and you can't feed uh, animals on bank credit. Hmm. Well, uh, we don't near only have to worry about a drought here in the United States, but what if we had a drought in the countries where we're receiving all our imports? Uh, they couldn't possibly uh, send us anything because they're starving now. Well, thank you. I'll coming back to you in a moment. I, uh, uh, I would like to uh, comment a little bit on this corporation farming. All right, go ahead. It has been going on for a long time, and uh, I just want to warn the American people that if you permit it to happen, that you will duplicate what happened in Russia. 
Well, actually, there isn't much difference between uh, corporate farming and uh, what they do have in Russia. Not in operation, but uh, I would like to point up the difference of approach. In uh, Russia, when they set up communism, they liquidated their farmers. Either they shot them or sent them off to Siberia. <laughs> now, uh, we've uh, had a great deal more finesse in the United States. By underpaying them, we've liquidated two million farmers since 47, and uh, the intentions are that we can liquidate the number down to a million. Now, if this happens, the American people are going to go hungry because these corporations, uh, from the rec their own record, as I pointed out to the seminar, aren't capable of operating agriculture for the simple reason that they haven't proved to be capable of operating our corporations. Well, that's right. One, one comment I'd like to inject at this time in, re in relationship to uh, corporation farming is this, and I want to address this to the non-farmers, to the housewives, and to the clergy, and the educators, uh, to the people uh, living in the metropolitan areas and in the rural communities. Do you realize that you've got a greater stake in the family farm than the farmer himself? Let's just analyze corporation farming once and, and see what it means. First of all, the corporations have to pay from 48 to 52 percent corporation tax on their income. And secondly, they have to hire all of the uh, labor and the management. The corporations must pay dividends to the stockholders from 4 to 5 or 6 percent. In addition to this, they have to have profits in reserve for capital expansion. And the American people, if they permit the corporation structure to take over agriculture in the United States, you'll find that you'll pay approximately 50 cents out of your total income dollar just for food. The American people could have the highest price food in the world, and this is the stake that the people living in town have in the family farm. But I would like to turn now to another guest, and with us again today we have Father Dismas Treater uh, of the Franciscan Fathers from Pulaski, Wisconsin. And it's a real pleasure to have him with us because here's a reverend who is very much concerned about the condition of agriculture, about the conditional of our national economy, our monetary system, and so forth. And I'd like to call on you at this time, Father, to just make whatever statements that you feel free to do. Would you refresh my mind concerning what percent of the national wealth comes from the soil? I think I heard you say it a number of times. Well, let's put it this way. A lot of people, as we were flying up here uh, for this seminar today, we were looking out the windows of the plane. And all you see is land, farmland, grazing land, pasture land, cattle, and farm homes. And then every once in a while, we see a trinkling here or there of a city or a village. Agriculture is the largest industry in the world, and it represents the investment in agriculture represents approximately 60% of the total investment of every business and corporation in the United States. And approximately 70% of all of the resources that we consume during uh, a given year are the food and far, uh, fiber products that come from the land. The figure I was waiting for was at 70. 70% 70 of the national wealth comes directly from the soil. And uh, we know from Psalm 23, I believe it is, uh, the statement that the earth and its bounty are the Lord's. Man is merely a steward. It doesn't belong to him absolutely. And it certainly has to be God's desire that this land be distributed as widely as possible, not just in a few hands. Because if too few people control it, then they can set the price too high. In order to set the price the farmers they're on the land now, they have to organize and get a just price. But they certainly have a right to that. So man is a steward of the soil, and uh, it's desirable that the land be distributed as widely as possible, the possession of it. We know that in the past, uh, after the Second World War, I know a man from Pulaski, another one from Chilton, Wisconsin, who were sent, one to Poland, the other to Germany, respectively, to help set up agriculture on its feet and to break up large estates. We know that's one of the big evils of South America. And they're too big. Well, this too is our policy down there, is to put the people back on the land. Yes, but what are we doing here? 
We're first building it up. We're doing the opposite. We're, we're building it up by putting the farmer into debt, first of all. And then we'll create more debt, more cost, by breaking up after we found out that's no good. That's right. They've already found out in Russia that it's no good. So why should we now set it up here and, and complicate or repeat their mistakes? To well, me, it doesn't make sense. It looks like we're the type of people that always put the stop signs up after it's too late. Close the bound after, after, horse, after horses the horses gone. are gone. Uh -huh. Mr. Wilkin, I'd like to uh, thank you very much, Father. Mr. Wilkin, I'd like to uh, return to you for just a moment. And uh, you presented a very interesting uh, analysis at the seminar this weekend, uh, uh, actually proving that every gross farm dollar of national income creates or generates seven dollars of national income and that every dollar that we underpay the American farmer, that we lose $7 of national income, and that's, that it's due to the underpayment of agriculture for the past 15 years uh, that has caused this fantastic debt-fueled economy we're living in. And I have with me now the five tables that you had prepared proving it five different ways. I wonder if you'd like to elaborate on this. Well, the... <coughs> The seven times turn is proven by the record, and it was specifically proven in the period from 43 to 52. In this 10-year period, we had the answer to our economic problems in operation with a 90% price support. In this seven, in this 12-year period, and you will have to look in uh, President Kennedy's economic report to Congress in 1962, because since that time, the records have been changed. Now, in this 10-year period, the price of farm products at wholesale, the price of all products at wholesale, and the consumer price were in a balance of approximately 100% as an average. And in that 10-year uh, period, for every dollar of farm production that entered that economic cycle of ours, we generated $6.97 of national income. Now, what more proof do, do we need than that? Well, uh, you've certainly convinced a lot of people uh, at this seminar, Mr. Wilkin, but now here's another thing that, uh, another myth that I think should be exposed, and this is the, the law of supply and demand. Uh, uh, throughout the world today, we understand we have approximately, we have approximately uh, uh, two-thirds of the world population earning less than $100 a year. People are starving and they're going hungry. Is that because they don't like to eat? No, it's because they haven't got any money. Uh, why don't they have any money? Because society over the generations hasn't been willing to pay for the production of farm products. It's nothing new. And uh, through underpayment, have prevented the development of their agriculture and the income with which to buy tools of production to increase their production. Now, to illustrate, uh, the conflict in, in theories. For example, we're going down to South America and we're advising them to put the uh, farmers on the la people on the land. Okay. But in the meantime, through our manipulation of our own farm prices, which in turn has forced world prices down, they can't afford to operate those farms. But sure. after giving them that advice, we turn around and liquidate two million farmers in the United States by underpaying them. Well, How now, do you make that add up? Well, now what are we trying to do? Of course, uh, we're going to solve this, Carl, by free trade now. If we can get the common market to uh, lower <laughs> their tariffs. Um, no. <laughs> no, the latest proposition, it's on the drawing boards. It hasn't been brought out in the open. But this year, the American farmers are being asked to produce 20 to 25 percent more corn, feed grain, wheat, and soybeans. And and it could be paid less for it, I suppose. Well, the, uh, the uh, Department of Agriculture has already announced that they expect the net farm income to be 5 to 7 percent less next year than this year. For, for producing more. For producing right. 15 million acres more of uh, goods and services. But here's the point I want to make, see. These experts in Washington haven't got the slightest idea, nor do our farmers, of how much we're going to produce next year. Because we have no one that can tell us whether we're going to have the rain to produce it with. And in spite of the expansion that they want in this production, we might end up in uh, 
1967 with less production we had in 66. Don't you think if we ever get behind again that we can never catch up? Well, we've been behind uh, for uh, uh, 15 years, and uh, the uh, so-called surplus was nothing more than underconsumption. For example, in the balance sheet that I presented to the uh, seminar, covering the 15 years following 4850 as 100, the record proves that we lost $627 billion of income entirely. Now, think of the underconsumption wrapped up in $627 billion of income in 15 years. And in my opinion, if we were to restore the balance between uh, agriculture, rural America, and industrial America, we would have to increase our farm production 15% above the level, or we wouldn't have enough to go around. Well, we're not only uh, liquidating or eliminating our farmers, but we're also running short of food. And on top of it, as a result of the loss of national income, we're going to head ourselves right into a depression on top of it. We couldn't be in much more serious condition, could we? Well, if this program uh, takes place and uh, you try to liquidate enough farmers to bring it down to a million, you're going to li uh, liquidate uh, uh, small business, you're going to liquidate all the small corporations, and you're going to liquidate the large corporations. And even small bankers, too. Now, one of my reasons right. that for being against uh, the corporate management, see, is that our corporate leaders have proved beyond question that they are not good managers. For example, in the seminar with the balance sheet covering 51 to 65, uh, I pointed out that the corporations, mind you, supposedly with the business brains in the United States, lack $222 billion of profits after taxes to balance with wages and interest. Now, what did they do to offset that? They added $365 billion to the gross corporate debt. Now, is that kind of a management going to be good for agriculture and the supply of food to keep the people from starving? In my opinion, no. Well, I see that we're once again running out of time. And uh, Mr. Jackson, I wonder if you'd like to make a closing statement on this, and then I'd like to have you close out the program, Father. Well, I, I think that all of us tonight will see the time soon when we will be rationed for food. I think this theory of overproduction is gone forever. I, I read a recent statement where we had 70, an increase of 70 million people in the world this year, and no additional food was raised to feed them. But within the next four years, just four years, the world population will increase by 300 million. Now that's a million more people than we have in the United States today. And when you think of putting, you might say, a complete new nation of people in the world in four years' time, 100 million bigger than we are in the United States, where will the food come from to feed us? We've got I think something we're to food, worry about. I think we're facing food rationing right Would now. Would you like to close it out? Well, considering the forces combined against the farmer, I think it's evident to everybody that time is running out fast. And I think the time to save the farm, if ever, is now. Is now. I think that's a good closing statement. And it's certainly been a pl pleasure to have you gentlemen with us today to participate on this seminar. And I hope that we have extended a challenge to the American people to wake up and to pull your heads out of the sand and to analyze the conditions that the American people are confronted with. Because if we don't wake up now, as the Father said, it's going to be too late. Time is our greatest enemy. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. U.S. Fox presented a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of the nation's outstanding leaders. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers.